All right, well, good evening. Welcome to Life Bridge. My name is Grant. Uh, Steve and Darian are such a great example of many, many stories that we have at Life Bridge and really everything that we're all about. They were a couple who had had some church experience, most of it when they were kids. They had had some church experience, but they had kind of quit on the church. They had kind of stopped, and that might identify you. You might just be like that. You're like, yeah, maybe I never went to church, or maybe I went to it when I was a kid, but it's never really meant anything to me. And then as they got plugged in, as they started to connect, as they started to do that again as, a, as mature adults, as they began to make that connection, they began to find God in the church. And it's almost kind of humorous uh, nowadays that, that sometimes it's funny to think that you could find God at the church. Because it seems to be that the church faces a lot of criticism. Uh, it's kind of like Yelp, right? I, I do this. I'm stupid for doing it. But I will choose a restaurant based on what Yelp tells me to do. How many people are avid Yelp checkers? Okay, at least one person knows what I'm talking about anyway. But if you go on Yelp, it's an app you got on your phone. And you can go to any restaurant, any movie theater, any store, and you can get reviews on it. And it's different than like Google or Facebook or something like that because you can't remove the reviews. Okay, so you can't. Re so you know that these are honest reviews. The problem is it manages to draw out the most negative people in our culture. So I will go to a restaurant and I will go and I will absolutely love my experience. I can look up that restaurant and I can look at Yelp and they'll be like, the service was terrible. My food was cold when I got it. You call that pork, right? You know, I mean, it's just on and on and on. It goes like that. And so we review restaurants and we review movie theaters and we get this idea that that's where we want to go based on what other people are saying. The church has been facing criticism uh, for a long, long time, and it faces the same sort of criticism that just your average uh, bowling alley or movie theater or restaurant faces. And the thing about it is, just like any criticism, a lot of the criticism is accurate criticism. Accurate criticism. Like, I'm not one of those people who will defend somebody I love no matter what. Let me explain. Like, I love my kids. I got four kids, and my kids are incredible, and I love them, and I support them, and I've got their backs, and I'm behind them. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to support every stupid thing they do. And they do stupid things every once in a while, right? I'm not going to defend a stupid action just because I love them and I'm on their page, right? And I'm not going to do the same thing with the church. Some people criticize the church. And rightly so, because there's a lot of stuff that the church does wrong. I lived in Missouri for about 12 years of my life. And uh, if you go to Missouri, I-44 runs all the way down through the middle of Missouri, and there's these huge billboards all along the way that you can rent. I looked at renting them one at a time because I was curious. They rent for about $2,000, okay? So I knew that they were pricey. Well, on this road, you'll go and you'll see, and if you've ever driven through Missouri, you've probably even seen this billboard, there's one example, there's several of these that these people have rented out. I don't even know who they are that's rented them out. But one of the ones I remember is they have rented out, and on it, it simply says this. He who divorces his wife and marries somebody else commits adultery. God. That's it. No phone number, no website, no extra information at all. Just, we wanted you to know right? Not even a scripture reference on there. Imagine if any other organization on earth did their advertising like that. Imagine if, imagine if Oscar Mayer just put up a billboard and all it said was, sometimes rats fall in the meat grinder. <laughs> right? That's what we've got. Anyway, that's what happens, you know? And so many people in church, they just do weird things and it's odd behavior. And if you flick on the TV, you'll find preachers asking their congregations to buy them planes. Or, and it seems like it's almost a prerequisite if you're going to be on television and you're going to be a preacher that you've got to be running some sort of a scam, right? You can get online and you can buy a photo of the preacher. Or you can buy a handkerchief that the preacher is blessed and it's only going to cost you $200 or something. It seems, seems like a prerequisite they'd be running a scam. There are a lot of really accurate criticisms for the church. And I want to just say plainly and clearly, it's actually kind of obvious why that is. There's a couple different reasons why there is uh, this in the church. First one looks like this. Not everyone who attends church is part of the church. 
Right? Just because you go to church, just because you say you're a preacher, just because you read out of the Bible, just because you attend church doesn't actually mean that you're a part of God's church. There's no, there's no way to sneak in the back door. This is not like a movie theater. Anybody ever do that? Sneak in the movie theater and you got to see the movie whether you paid or not? There is no way for you to kind of sneak in the back door. You might attend church, but the only way for you to be actually a part of the the church is if God makes you a part of, of the church. And the only way for that to happen is that if you believe authentically in Jesus Christ. So obviously not everyone who attends church is part of the church. Another reason, there's some criticism that's completely valid. Not everyone who leads church is from God. Not everyone that leads church is from God. Again, again it's like a prerequisite. You, you got to have some sort of scam or something to get on television. There's a lot of people out there that lead church from a very, a very self-fulfilling perspective. And finally, and the, again, these are obvious. I'm saying things that are, that are pretty obvious. People who follow God still have problems. Some of the most sincere followers of Christ that I've ever met who are a part of the church, who have found a new life, are still at times jack wagons. They're, they're still at times got the wrong attitude, the wrong mindset. They, they, are, not, they are not perfect. And so obviously there's things in the church that, that deserve criticism. On the other hand, the church faces a lot of criticism that I guess I'll call inaccurate criticism. And what I, what I mean by that is that it's criticism, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad thing. And it comes usually from a lack of understanding. One big reason for this, and this is something the church has always been criticized for, is, is because the truth, the truth is rarely popular. The truth is rarely popular. Now, you might be sick of hearing about this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up just because it's so current. Um, Bruce Jenner, as you guys finally know, I know there was a collective groan in the audience, so do we really have to hear about this? Uh, Bruce Jenner has made the decision to become Caitlyn Jenner. And in this process, like it's brought up a lot of, a lot of hubbub, a lot of, a lot of people talking about it. But I would, I would say, if I could approach Bruce Jenner, if I somehow got the opportunity to sit down and, and meet with him, this is exactly what I would say. I would try to in some way communicate how very much God loves him. How very, very much God loves him. In fact, he doesn't just love him, he, he displayed that love for him by dying on a cross for him. And there is nothing that Bruce or Caitlin can do to take away from the fact that God loves them more than he has ever been loved by anybody in his entire life. God loves him. And I would also, in some way, try to communicate, if I got this opportunity, I would communicate that I love him. Because God loves you and because you're a human being and God created you in his image, I just want you to know how very, very much I love you and I care for you. And if there's anything that I can do in my life to help you connect with God, I want to do that with everything that I have. And everybody in the world would go, yeah, that's great. But my conversation couldn't end there. My conversation would be with, with what it is so many other conversations that I've had. So many people that I've talked with. I would say to Bruce, and Bruce, what you need, what you need more than anything else and what every person on earth needs, what I need is to believe in God, to return to your heavenly Father, to follow him obediently. I had to make that decision in my life. And there was things that that I was doing and there was sin in my life and I was far from God and I turned from that. I repented of that and I came home to my father and he threw his arms around me and he brought me close. And Bruce, if you, if you want to have a relationship with God, if you want to return to your heavenly father, you need to, just like I did and just like everybody who does this, everybody needs to repent. And the current decisions that you've made in your life, just like my sins and just like anybody, other, uh, anybody else's sins, they are the definition of debauchery. And you need to turn, with, turn from them. Not, not just you, but every person needs to turn from their sin and return to God. 
And as lovingly and as patiently and as carefully as I might choose my words, people are still not going to hear that as love. People still aren't going to receive that. And the truth is rarely popular. And so the church faces a lot of criticism because its job, one of its job, is to tell God's truth. Another reason we have this criticism is most don't understand God's plan for the church. Most people look at the church outwardly and they have no idea what's going on. People who don't know the difference between a religion and a denomination, I I actually get this a lot. People People don't know what the Bible says. They don't know what a religion is versus what a denomination is. They really don't know much about the church at all. They don't know what God's plan is. They don't know how it's supposed to work, but they are quick to criticize it. And so the church faces all this this criticism, and some of it's valid, and some of it's just misinformed. And you might be coming here tonight going, yeah, I don't don't know if I believe in the church. In fact, maybe you've even been coming for a while because you're just like, "I I don't know, this is the only place I can seem to come where I can figure out what the Bible says, but I don't really believe in the church. What I want to do tonight is I want to share with you God's perspective. Not what we might look at the church from like a Yelp review, not how many stars our culture gives the church, not what young people think of the church, not what old people think of the church, uh, not what people who aren't from the United States think of the church in the United States. I want to give you a perspective of what God thinks of the church. And the first and most important thing that you have to understand is that God loves the church. God absolutely loves the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's writing, and he's actually writing to husbands and wives, and he almost gets off on a tangent, and he's saying, you know, there's a way that a wife ought to act, and there's a way that a husband ought to act. And when he describes how a husband ought to act, He gets so excited about his analogy that he almost forgets he's talking about husbands. This is what he says. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And it's almost like he forgot that he was talking about husbands and wives, and he goes off on this little tangents, and and, oh yeah, and oh yeah, by the way, husbands, that's how you ought to treat your wives. And all the husbands went, do we have to? Right? That's how he said. He compared the church to God is like God's bride. In the book of Revelation, that's how it refers to the church. It refers to the church as the bride of Christ. 18 years ago, I got married to Bethany Agler, and uh, she is absolutely everything to me. Uh, in, in the 18 years we've been married, we've had four kids, and we've been through up times and down times, and it hasn't been all perfect, but I can tell you I absolutely love my wife. And we may not know each other at all today, and after the service is over, we might strike up a conversation, and you and I might find out that we have all kinds of things in common, that we have all the Lord of the Rings memorized. We might... We might find out that we're both into fantasy football and we'll stand there back there like a bunch of nerds talking about whether Adrian Peterson's going to play for the Vikings next year. And and we might find out we have all kinds of things in common and and we'll hit it off. And then one day I'll introduce you to my wife and and you'll meet her and and then you might go, yeah, I I don't really like your wife. No matter how much we have, which has never happened, by the way, if anybody's ever met my wife, like she's just, she's you have to like her, it's a requirement, but if that ever happened, like our relationship, it just, how could it work? How could it continue to move forward? I I don't care how much we have in common, this is my wife, and that's how God views the church. He says the church is his beautiful bride that he died for, that he gave his life for, so that she could be redeemed and she could be made holy. You need to understand, God, despite what everybody else thinks about the church, regardless of how people uh, in the outside world, they view the church, God, he is madly in love with his church. Next, you need to know this, 
The church has always been God's plan. This kind of blew my mind the first time I realized that all the way back in the time of Abraham, which is about 4,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, before there was a nation of Israel, before the Ten Commandments, before the whole Exodus, before all of that happened, God showed up and began his plan. And he turned to a guy named Abram. And he turned to Abram and he said, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore. And that's how God began to develop his plan that you and I are experiencing today. Listen to the words that God said. In Genesis chapter 12, he says this to Abram, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. Listen to this. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples on earth will be blessed from you. Well, what happened is, if you've, if you've read the Old Testament before, what happens is God turns Abram's seed and all of his people, he turns them into this, this great nation. But kind of the opposite of being blessed happens to all peoples on earth. In fact, what God does is now that they're a nation, he sends them into the promised land. And he sends them into the promised land and he said, there are some horrible evil people in this land. There's the Philistines and the Amicalites and these guys, when you go in there, they are horrible. They like burn their children in the fire and they worship odd, just crazy things and they do horrible things to each other. These guys make ISIS look like somebody that you would invite to your kid's birthday party, okay? And he sends them into the land and he says, I want you to go in there and I want you to rid the land of them. And so they go in and they make war and I don't know, I have a hard time seeing the Philistines as they're being attacked by David, feeling as though they were blessed by the seed of Abraham. And you see it and you're like, what does it mean that they're going to be blessed by the seed of Abraham? And it isn't until 2,000 years after that promise that God establishes through Jesus Christ the church. And people that believe in Jesus, they begin to follow and they begin to spread the message and Jesus gives this message. He says, I want you to go to every tribe and every nation and every language. And I want you to go until the ends of the earth, until everybody has heard. And even now, as we're gathered here today, we've got a couple of people from LifeBridge who, uh, who went to Africa. And they're in Africa working on a mission in Africa in the biggest slum in the world telling people about Jesus and the people that they are there telling about Jesus. There are other people there who believe in the name of Jesus. And all people on earth have been blessed through Abraham, have been blessed because that's God's plan. It's the church. It's always been his plan. Another example, in, in uh, about 600 years before Jesus, uh, we talked about this last week. If you weren't here this last week, we talked about Daniel and and one of the most powerful kings at the time was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, and nobody could interpret it, and so they called for Daniel. And Daniel came, and he interpreted the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. Here's, here's what Nebuchadnezzar's dream looked like. He had this vision of this incredible statue that stood above everything else in the land. It looked almost like this. And the top of the, the head was gold, and the, the chest and the arms were silver, the, the stomach and the thighs were bronze and the legs were made of iron. And he couldn't figure out what the dream meant. And finally Daniel came to him and said, Nebuchadnezzar, I want you to know what this dream means. The head that's made out of gold represents your kingdom. That's why the head lo looks like Nebuchadnezzar, at least as far as we know. He said, this, this head is like your kingdom. After your kingdom ends, there's going to come another kingdom. And that kingdom is going to be weaker than yours, and so it's silver. And after that, there's going to become a kingdom that's weaker than that, and it's going to be bronze. And then after that will come a kingdom, a nation, that is stronger than any other nation that there has ever been before it. Now, from our perspective, this is like one of the easiest things in the world to happen because this is exactly what happened. Over the next 600 years, Babylon fell, and then there came the Persians, and they were a weaker empire but they, uh, after Babylon. And then there came the Greeks, and they were a weaker empire than, that, empire than that. And then there came the Romans. And the Romans were stronger than any nation that had ever existed before. Now check this out. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, 
He says, I saw this statue, and then all of a sudden there was this giant rock that was cut out the side of a mountain, and it was hurled at the feet of this great statue, and it crushed the statue, and it fell to the ground. And he's going, Daniel, what does this mean? And Daniel says this, next verse. In the time of those kings, talking about the Roman Empire, the Iron Legs, he says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision the rock cut out of the mountain. Now go back to that image that we had just before. That rock was established by Jesus. His kingdom that he established was the church. That rock that destroys all other kingdoms, that rock that is unseen to most people but is the very power from God, that rock is the church. God's plan has always been the church. And whether we understand it or not, whether we always get it or not, whether we've always seen it this way or not, God has been working his kingdom for the last 2,000 years. The church has always been God's plan. And finally, this is important to get, God manifests himself. See, I don't even think this is a good idea, but this is what God does. God manifests himself in the church. If you've uh, been around church people very often, you probably hear this term that we use every once in a while called the Trinity. What we mean by the Trinity is this is just our kind of small-minded way of trying to figure out like what, what it is to be God. And so we've looked at the scripture and we've been looking at it this way for the last 1,700 years and we go, yeah, we feel like, we feel like as we get from scripture that there's three different parts of God. And so the Trinity represents those three different parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're like, yeah, those are all, they're all one, they're all the same thing, but they're kind of manifested in three different parts. Actually, I think you could probably look at the New Testament and make a case that there's actually four. There's a quadinity. Is that what you would call it? A quadinity? Let's do that. We're the church of the quadinity. The, there's actually four parts to it. There's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit, and then there is His church because God's presence is in and God has manifested himself in the church. Example of this, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, just like your body has many different parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. It isn't just Life Bridge. It isn't just Metro or South Point or Beacon Baptist. It's not just the churches downriver. It's not just churches across the United States. It's not just churches in different parts and different countries. It doesn't have anything to do with the individual preachers and the different parts. It's all one body that encompasses the entire earth. And then he says, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. If you belong to Christ, you are a part of the body of Christ, and God has manifested himself in his people on the earth. And if somebody's going to know God's plan for their life, if he's going to understand their word, the truth, it's going to happen through his people and the sweat of of his people and the wisdom of his people and the willingness to go. God manifests himself here on the earth. Now, a, a few years ago, Bill Hybels, uh, Bill Hybels is probably, probably one of the most uh, powerful leaders, a major dynamic shift in the church, uh, Willow Creek in Chicago, he's a pastor of the church. He said this, and this isn't very profound, but this really caught me as profound and really it, it shouldn't, but it might strike you as profound. He said the local church is the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world. We don't always view it that way. 
But the local church is God's plan. And God doesn't always do things with a lot of blitz and a lot of sizzle. Right? When he came to this earth, he was born into a manger, and he, he walked on this earth, and he didn't have, a lot of, didn't have a, lot of, a large entourage that followed him around. It was just humbly the Son of God who walked on the earth, and he does the same thing through the church. If you look at all the different organizations and entities and empires that exist across the globe, you might not think, wow, yeah, the church, <laughs> that's where it is. But that's God's plan because he manifests himself in the church. Now, here's why I say all of this. Because, again, we view the church kind of like we're picking a restaurant or a movie theater or something like that. We, we view it as something that we kind of rate and we kind of, we kind of try to, from our own perspective, look at it. But really what we need to do is we need to say, how, how does God want us to view the church? Uh, when I was in college, I was, uh, I was not the brightest person. And that was only half my problem. I wasn't the brightest person, and on top of that, I was a terrible procrastinator, like terrible. I'm, I still procrastinate. Everybody on staff can just shut up. I still procrastinate uh, every once in a while, but I was a terrible procrastinator. And one of the things, I would just put off things that I didn't absolutely need to do. Well, I spent my entire time in college, the first three years, working my tail off in the summers, uh, trying to make as much money as I could. I would work all throughout the school year. I was just trying to get as much money as I could so I could pay my bill. And about three times a year, my parents or one of my friends or my teachers would turn to me and say, hey, you ought to go to the financial aid office and see if they could help you. And I always went, yeah, yeah, I should do that. One of these days, I'm going to do that. And I missed that my entire first year, didn't go to the financial aid office, just to see if there's any little thing that they could do for me. And finally, one day in my second year, I was like, you know what, I am going to go up there. So I went up there and everybody was at lunch. So I didn't come back. And then the next year, I finally went up there, and I was like, okay, this time I'm actually going to see. Maybe there's a little bit of something that they could do for me. And people would tell me stories about how you can get thousands and thousands of dollars that they'll help you with your school bill. I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I bet you can. Nah, I'll just work really hard, right? So I'm working my tail off through the summers and the school year doing this. Never go to the financial aid. My, fin my final year, I finally go in there. I gave them all my financial information. I filled out all their forms. I finally gave in and did it. And my school that year was free because I'm poor. And if I would have just gone to the financial aid office that whole time, I wouldn't have had to work my butt off the way I worked my butt off. And sometimes for those of you out there, that's maybe churches. You're like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure church is good and everything. A lot of times you're trying to find a relationship. You're trying to find the answers to life. Or maybe you come to church once in a while or once a week and you're just like, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. But the power of God and everything that God wants to do in your life is hiding behind this, this awesome humble little thing called the church. Here's what people are saying about the church. Here's just a, a few things. I want to know God, but not the church. And God, again, that's like saying you want to know me, but not my wife. It, it doesn't work like that. And yeah, people are messed up and broken, and there's people in the church that don't even belong to the church, and, but it doesn't work like that. You get to know God through his community of people. Second thing people are saying, the church is an hour event for me each week. Actually, people don't usually say it this way. Usually people are just kind of like, I go to church. What do you want from me, right? That was, that was my dad growing up. He's like, we go to church every week. Thanks, that's all I need, right? The church is so much bigger than an hour once a week. God's divine plan is not 60 minutes a week. It's the larger community and group of people. Other people say this, I want to go to church but not be a part of the mission. In other words, I want to go to church, yeah, but I don't really want to like, help the church move forward. I don't want to reach people that don't know him. I don't want to touch people's lives that, that don't. And I just, that isn't the church. Christ called us to, to join with him in his mission. So my point today is love the church the way that God loves the church. Get, get involved in the church the way that, that God wants you to get involved in church. Don't just attend uh, like a, for 60 minutes a week, but find people. 
find connections, build relationships, devote yourself to being a part of his kingdom. Stephen Darian's story that we saw at the very beginning is just, just a powerful example of so many people that have done this. That connection card that we hit every week, we always put it in the bulletin, we, every single week we're like, if you want to get connected to life, Ridge, if you... Anybody get sick of hearing that? Because we say it every single week. Some of you have been coming to church here for a year and a half, and you're like, do we have to hear that spiel again? Yes, you have to hear that spiel again because we desperately want you to be a part of more than just 60 minutes every Sunday. Be a part of what God's doing here on earth. Let me pray for it.